Hello, welcome to Virtual Humans uh, Lecture 1.1. Uh, this is Introduction to Human Models. And in this lecture, we're going to see what are the key ingredients to build the human model and how to fit it to data. And in particular, we're going to look at a little bit of history of um, earlier works uh, that led us to the point where we are right now. So let's get started. So since the beginning of civilization, we spend our lives interacting and perceiving humans. That's the society we live in where humans play a central role. The human body and human interaction has been depicted many times throughout history. So humans interact with the world to change it. They touch, they manipulate, and they form the world around them. They interact with each other to form relationships, to find love, to make friendships, to dance, to influence people. They interact with the world to change it, for example, to move and grab objects, to climb, and to become full partners with humans, computers need to be able to see us. And by see us, we mean understand our interactions, our intentions, our gestures, our body language, and our interactions with the world. We real humans, we do this like um, in subconsciously and um, and we have these predi predi predictive models of the world which are necessary in order to um, live and interact with other people. And so if computers can see us, they would basically be able to learn about us by, by watching us. So since humans are at the center of many applications and at the center of social interaction, uh, it's not surprising that there's so many applications that require virtual humans. So for example, for autonomous driving, you need to understand what humans are doing to avoid accidents. Uh, for man-machine interactions, if we want natural communication, um, like they need to understand our intentions and our emotions. And for virtual and augmented reality, if, for example, we want to communicate with people across the globe seamlessly, like not with Zoom, but in a more immersive experience in 3D, we need these virtual humans enable, like be able to reproduce like um, indistinguishable virtual humans in this, in this so-called metaverse. So of course, like the big tech companies then are very much interested in, um, in, in investing in virtual humans. And um, this is reflected by a lot of hires in this area. So here I'm just showing you two posts, for example, from Facebook, Meta, um, Google, um, where they are hiring researchers and engineers in the field of human body perception and visual computing and 3D human modeling. So, I'm, I'm often asked whether I have students that are interested in doing internships or, or entering as full-time employees in, 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 this, um, in these companies. And, um, and I think this is basically growing um, every year. Of course, like virtual humans are also needed for any application that requires 3D content creation. So for example, like 3D movies, like um, often make use of virtual humans in order to create special effects. Um, and you want this, um, you would like to be able to create this as fast and um, uh, as fast as possible and in, a, in, a, in an efficient manner that is not time consuming. So as I said, these big tech companies, they have a, a growing interest in building digital humans or virtual humans. And uh, for example, here you see um, virtual humans of the, the CTOs of, of uh, the CEOs of NVIDIA and Meta. And some of these demos are truly impressive. Like they create virtual avatars that, that look very, very realistic, um, which, which is already very impressive. However, these models are very specific to one subject and they require a long time to produce. So how they typically produce these digital characters and these demos is by capturing people with multiple cameras in light stages. So by changing the lighting, they build like a personalized model 
that then like um they can you know test time they can change the light and um they can perhaps even animate it but these models are specific to one person and uh, they require an expensive equipment and do not scale very well if we want to do this very quickly, for example, with a consumer grade camera. So the goal of research is to democratize this human model creation, to make it as accessible as possible, as fast as possible. And for this, we need to go beyond personalized models. We need to uh, have models that generalize across a population of people. And so basically we need to build statistical models of, of, of virtual humans. So um, let's look at what the ingredients that are needed to build uh, virtual humans. When, when I talk about virtual humans, um, I typically think about either the appearance or the behavior. And I like to think about these two things separately. Um, so the appearance is how we look. Basically, um, how do we build the surface and the appearance such that it produces like um, a person that looks like a real person. Um, so these uh, virtual models, they should move and look like real people and they should be easy to control and to animate and easy to fit to data. We will see later why it's so important that they are easy to fit to data. So when it comes to modern people without clothing, like we have a good understanding and we've made um, very good progress. When it comes to modern people with clothing, like uh, things are developing very fast and we have very cool like neural based models, but I would say there's still a lot of work to do and also to model like realistic facial and hair, uh, facial expressions and hair and, and these details that, that make us real. There's still lots of work to be done. Um, but the idea of this virtual human is that you have a few parameters that produce different people, right? They are not specific to one subject, but basically they generalize across a population of, of people. So this is the generation. This is more of a computer graphics problem, this, this, this first part. But there's then like a perception problem, which is like I'm given like some visual observations, for example, images or video, and we want to understand what people are doing. There's been like a, the dominant paradigm has been to detect just the key points of people in images, but we want to go much beyond that. We want to estimate like the 3D shape, the pose, the geometry of, of people, like including the appearance uh, and, and the textures and capture all the personal details that, that make us real. And so this is a, a classical computer vision problem. And you can imagine that this two problems, generation and perception are very intertwined. And if you have a good generative model, you can um, you can leverage it to, to, to perceive humans in images and vice versa. If you are able to perceive people in images, you can link it and build these um, generative models from, um, from more and more observations. So when we talk about behavior, um, so far the state of affairs in, in research, we are talking about how people interact with the 3D world. This requires um, to perceive people not in isolation, like it has been traditionally been done, but capture people within the context of the 3D environment. And for these like researchers, this is, for example, like work from our group where we capture um, the 3D environment first, and then we capture the human and we localize the 3D human within the environment. And um, I we believe this is crucial to understand how people actually navigate and interact with the 3D world. And now if we're able to perceive how people behave in the 3D world, um, like and then we can build virtual human models that can um, interact autonomously within the 3D world. We can synthesize human motion that looks realistic and that adapts to the different environments, um, like what I'm showing you here. So these two goals, like both for modeling appearance and to model behavior, these are two goals that are inter, inter, interrelated. So one is the computer vision goal, which is train computers to see us. And then is the computer graphics um, task, which is train avatars to basically mimic us. Now the boundary between these two is like, um, it's not very clearly defined because many times to solve one problem, you need to solve the other, or you need to solve both problems at the same time. 
So, but it, but it's traditionally like this has been like um, two different um, two different goals. So, in terms of perceiving people in, in images, um, why why is this difficult? We we can do it with no problem, but for for a computer, this is uh, very difficult. So the challenges are, first of all, from an image, you're losing the depth. You don't have like a 3D in these 2D projections. So it's very difficult to know like, you know, how like to estimate the depth from a single image. You have unusual poses, which makes a very complex space of um, high dimensions, but basically these poses live in some manifold um and um then basically you have occlusions like people occlude each other or like there's self occlusions because some body parts of one person occlude like uh, some other body parts uh sometimes you have low contrast you have noise you have different backgrounds um you have different shapes of people you have like kids or people that are um thinner people that are heavier and um, yeah, you can have like all sorts of lighting conditions, different clothing, estimating people under clothing is, is challenging. So you can already imagine that um, modeling people from visual data is a real, really challenging problem. And this has been a core problem in computer vision for many years. So I think it's really uh, interesting to look a little bit about the history and look at, at early models and and so what, what were the first body models that were built? Um, I I personally find it very interesting to see what people were doing before before I even started uh, my PhD, be before even I was born. Um, I think it's uh, sometimes illuminating and sometimes it's uh, inspiring to see how ideas develop and how and which ideas made a breakthrough in, in their time. So these slides are based on the simple made simple tutorial and uh, they're based on, on a talk that was given by Michael Black. I think he knows the history much better than I do. So you, you might also wanna look at this as well. So since the invention of photographic techniques, people have been using, using them to study motion. And in fact, in part, the development of these techniques was driven by the desire to understand human and animal motion. And um, the topics we'll cover in this lecture fall uh, within this long tradition of motion analysis, analysis through image capture. However, the tools and the techniques and some of the motivations and goals have um, changed since then. So a key influence in the field was the work by Johansson where um, basically like, um, let me read this excerpt from the, from the paper, which was published in Perception and Phys Psychophysics. It's like the motion of the living body was represented by a few bright spots describing the motions of the main joints. 10 to 12 such elements in, a, in an adequate motion combinations evoke a compelling impression of human walking, running, dancing, and so on. Um, and it's true that um, these key points evolved this uh, impression of a human. But of course, um, there's a lot of things that are missing here. And um, in some way, like all these things that are missing, uh, I mean, the key points are the things that we're going to be interested in modeling during this lecture. However, this was a key influence in the field. And basically, this um, key point uh, tracking has been a dominant paradigm in computer vision. People, there's a lots of papers on just tracking the key points and they are excellent and they are the building block for um, doing more elaborate things. But of course, there's the question of like, are key points just enough? So first of all, like these joints are not visible in images. Uh, like this, these joints of the body are not visible, so they are not directly observable. So it's um, it's interesting that there's been so much interest in this when they are not even like um, observable. So basically, if we want to model interactions with other people and with the world, we need to think about contact. And the joints don't contact the world. It's the surface. It's our skin that touches the world. So in that sense, it makes sense to model the surface as well. Also, the impression you have about other people is not based just on the posture, but it's based on everything, right? On, 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 on like the facial expressions and um, our body shape and even the clothing we're wearing. wearing. 
Um, so, so all these things, they, they need to be modeled as well. Um, yeah, so our shape is also related to our health and basically how we look um, basically is related how, how to, the, to how the world perceives us. So let's look at a, a little bit of history. And um, I, I like to think of these three um, components uh, in, in inferring humans, human models from data. And it's interesting that um, these three components have not changed that much um, over the years. So that these are still the three components that you find in all algorithms. So the first two are basically you have to uh, define how your human model will move. And basically you have to parameterize like some primitives or some surface um, with, a, with a motion model. This is what is called the kinematic parameterization. And we're going to look we're going to see this um, in, in the lecture with uh, parameterizations exist for rotations, which are very suited for the human body, because you could think of it as a, as a collection of uh, parts that rotate uh, relative to each other. Then you need to define what is the shape. This defines what is the identity of the person. And um, you will see here, like models are more and more sophisticated. At the beginning, people were using very simple primitives like cylinders, and now people are using very sophisticated um, surface representations based on neural networks. Um, but still like the models nowadays, they need to define this, this human model. And then there's the inference part. How do you fit the model to observations? And um, the, the inference techniques have, have changed significantly. Earlier works were generative and based on optimization or particle filters nowadays it's it's mostly based on neural networks or combinations of neural networks and optimization so for inference what um what you want to do is to find the maximum a posteriori of the model parameters x these model parameters control for example the posture and the shape and the identity of the person given some observations, and if we're considering images, these observations might be the image I. So you want to find the maximum a posteriori, and what you typically do is you maximize the likelihood times the prior. The likelihood is like finding those, to maximize the likelihood, you, ha you, find to find, you have to find those parameters X that make the observations as likely as possible. And to maximize the prior, you, you want some parameters X that are within the space of valid poses, for example, the space of valid shapes. And this you can basically learn before you see any visual observations. So in terms of techniques, like the earlier works were mostly based on optimization. So techniques that are based on, on taking gradients or second order methods, or based on particle uh, based optimization. This is basically approximating the posterior based on a a set of samples. Every sample is like a um, hypothesis for the post or shape parameters X. Um, and those samples are weighted according to how likely this sample is. Um, right. So essentially, like the, the steps for most algorithms are similar. So basically, you have the image, you extract some features. These features might be silhouettes or edges. Um, anything that can be predicted by the model. And then basically you try to reproduce these uh, features with your model. You basically, this is what is called um, um, analysis by synthesis. You synthesize the silhouette with the model. So this is the, the original silhouette of the image. This is a silhouette of the model. And then basically you find some correspondence between these two. And then you take um, gradients with respect to the parameters in order to align these two silhouettes, for example. So you optimize. And in terms of features, you can use silhouettes or you can use edges, distance transforms, features, uh, optic flow. So there's many papers have used many different features. In the end, like any feature that can be predicted from the model and is fast to compute and differentiable, um, well, for, for some algorithms, um, then um, is a good feature. So basically the, the algorithms more or less like look at these different components. Now let's look at um, a, a little bit of the history of, of, of human body models. And it, it all started um, 
many years ago, as, as far as 45 years ago. Um, interesting, interestingly, by a paper by uh, from Hinton, in which um, he had like this uh, puppet based on rectangles, and he was trying to fit this puppet to key points. And basically, um, the argument of the paper is that if you try to fit every rectangle independently, it's going to be very ambiguous. But if you consider all the rectangles jointly in a holistic manner, then um, then basically you can uh, like have a better interpretation of where where the human um, where, where the puppet lies within these key points, and and this was actually his first paper. And there's a long history in in in, in modeling of the bodily of, of the body. Um, so like like so, some like works that were really the first ones were the work by Nevati and Binford and Mara and Nishihara, which um, they basically proposed a collection of primitives based on cylinders. And they basically had a theory on how to adapt these cylinders to different shapes. Um, and then basically they would fit this to, to, to range scanners. And what is interesting is that um, nowadays you can just take a Kinect and you know you get your depth data, but back then they had to build their own range scanners in order to um, like to demonstrate this. So in that sense, it was um, very hard to do research at that time. And the first work um, to to really fit human models, three D human models to images, was the groundbreaking work of of Hawk which um, basically the model was based on uh, matching model lines to edges detected in the image. So this was this generative approach that I was talking before. And this was as early as 1983. And so it was called like a program to see a walking person. And this was um, like, here's a, a video of the tracking. And uh, this was really like um, groundbreaking work and really ahead of its time. So how did this how did this body model look like? It was basically a set of handcrafted rules that defined um, like basically like how the ge geometric primitives should look like and how they would relate and how they could move relative to each other with some like um, handcrafted limits and so on. So it was very much like um, hand designed. And then like in the next decade, um, actually there were um, no papers. And so it's apparently like um, people had a hard time reproducing like the results from Hawk or they were um, basically, they were all like intimidated by, by the, the results that Hawk obtained and there was nothing. And um, then 10 years later, it picked up again and um, based on this classic idea that the body can be represented with a collection of parts and the motion can be parameterized with a kinematic tree where um, you have some parameters that define how the, each part can rotate and translate. And then basically every part rotates and rotates relative to its parent. This is what is called the kinematic tree. And this classical idea is still like, um, is still being used. I mean, this is the this these are the basics of the simple model, for example. Um, and then basically the posture of the person is parameterized with a set of joint angles. And then once you have this model and you have observations, you can um, fit this model to to image to to the images by extracting features and comparing like this model to this um, image features that might be what I was saying like distance transform edges or or whatever you can synthesize and extract from the image. So then, like um, as I said, like the it, it picked up again, like in uh, from ninety four to two thousand four, and people were able to reproduce the results from Hawk, and um, yeah, there were several works that basically used um, more elaborate primitives, like based on. Um, um, instead of cylinders based on super quadrics that could approximate the body better. Um, so, so the work of Garbita also like built on this and, and pushed this idea further and showed like, um, like a body model based on these super quadrics that could fit, be fit to multiple view 
images of a human and he used that to to track humans and notice here how this model these are the models of a male and a female and basically this is what um what he did during his PhD thesis then um the work by Breckler and Malik in CBPR 98 basically um showed how to um was one of the first works that could um like differentiate through the um, the observated through the likelihood with respect to the parameters so here what they did is to parameterize the optic flow with uh, the parameters of the body model and basically you would find the parameters that would minimize the, opti the typical optic flow objective if you have seen it in computer vision this is typically asking that pixels of one image warp to the next frame or vice versa um, you want that this uh, this is uh, consistent and you have a low error and these optic flow arrows, right? Basically, they were parameterized with with the with the with the body model. So this was actually a very influential paper. And um, in fact, this was the first paper I read uh, when I started my PhD, which I found quite interesting. And basically, they were parameterizing the body using twists and exponential maps, which is uh, parameterization of uh, rotations. That, that is used, for example, in the, in the simple body model, which is widespread um, nowadays. But these models were all handcrafted. They were defining these primitives, and they were not learned from data. And the first model that actually learned um, a model from data was this work by uh, Baumberg and Hawk, learning flexible models from image sequences in which they took silhouettes of people. They brought them into a canonical uh, pose and then they did PCA on these contours of people in order to have a model that with PCA you could basically um, produce different identities. But of course, um, like the problem is that we don't look like this um, like um, cylinder persons and the models don't match the data. It's difficult to synthesize these features as I was saying. Uh, so basically, these systems using these models, they tend to be um, not very robust. And essentially, if you want to have like a more robust model, you have to be able to explain the data better with a better body model. And for the computer graphics problem as well, like you you want um, you want a model that looks more realistic. So there's other works that, uh, there's many works actually, this is just a, a, a small collection of samples but some works uh, worth mentioning, for example, is the work of Sminchisesco and Trix. Uh, so as early as 2001, they had a, a model, which I think it's also based on Super Quadrix. Um, and the cool thing is that they showed how to do tracking and they have really quite impressive results for, for the time. And they, they showed how to differentiate through the model. And, um, and basically they proposed many um, objectives that are still like uh, relevant nowadays. And there's also the work by Terzopoulos and Metaxas that they basically fit these deformable models into images. Um, and then the work by Plankers and Foy in which, which they had like this, um, this um, spheres, like uh, these implicit spheres that, that would approximate the shape um, of the human body. But none of these models looked like really realistic, like a real person. And uh, the breakthrough really started with the face. And basically, this is the work by Blanz and Fetter, a morphable model of for the synthesis of 3D faces uh, in 99, in which they captured. Um, so here I'm showing you the um, different faces produced by the model. So essentially, um, what they did is to capture a lot of people with a, with a scanner that looked like this. And interestingly, this happened in Tübingen um, in 1989. And basically the, um, no, sorry, the, the paper like came up in 99 and the, the scanner uh, was first built in 89. And basically like what they did is to scan a lot of people and they built the model of the geometry of the face and also a model of the albedo um, of, of uh, the face and also of the lighting. And so basically they could um, both synthesize new faces or they could invert 
uh, the process by fitting these uh, model parameters into the image. And then basically they could reconstruct um, faces from images. Um, I'm, I'm still really impressed by these results uh, because this is 99. And um, I think these results are of a quality um, that matches some of the, the, the current state of the art. So this, this was really ground, groundbreaking work. And it happened here in Tübingen. So of course, um, then the obvious question is like, well, okay, why don't we do this exactly this for bodies? Let's scan lots of people and let's build a model of human bodies. Well, the problem is that uh, the body is much more complex. Um, it has 600 muscles, 200 bones, 200 joints, and many types of joints. Uh, so here you don't have to model only the face, but you have to model many more things. You have much more variability. If you want to model clothing, that makes it even more difficult. And basically we bulge, we breathe, we flex, we jiggle, our body change, uh, our body changes throughout the day. So, um, so it's, it's definitely much more challenging. The first thing, if you want to follow the same approach as Blanz and Fetter, you need to extend the technology of, of, of bodies, of, uh, of scanners, of face scanners to body scanners. And, um, the, the, the first body scanner was built by, by Cyberware. And then around 99, there was a US Army survey in which they scanned, they 3D scanned 2000 men and 2000 women from US and Europe. And, and they built this data set that is called the, the Caesar data set, which, uh, which, is, which has been instrumental to build body models. And, and it, it still is. But it's worth noting that this data set doesn't reflect the population of the world. It reflects the population of the US and Europe in 1999. So the body shapes, like uh, the, the demographics have changed. And also there's many ethnicities that are not represented in this um, data set. So, so a really pioneering, pioneering work is the work by Alan et al which they, they really showed us that basically you can take a template, you can register the template to each scan and then build a statistical model from it. They didn't have a, uh, a model for the formation of posts, but they had the first model of, um, of body shape statistics. And, uh, and this idea is still prevalent. And this is basically the core of, uh, of Simple, which is based on registering a template to different scans and then building a statistical model for it. And we're going to see why this is this registration step um, in the third lecture. I think it is like, we'll see why this is so important. So we will see this also in more technical detail. So basically like the, the pose model was missing. So that's why like animating the shapes didn't look very realistic. Um, but as I said, this work was um, really um, instrumental because it showed us that uh, you can model the statistics by registering everything to a common template. So um, like a breakthrough model was definitely like the scape model, which appeared in 2005. And basically uh, like they modeled the shape statistics and then using a single subject, they model like how um, our body deforms according to pose. So basically how the elbows um, deform when we flex, how the shoulders bulge and, uh, and change when we are performing different poses. And um, this was the first model that was actually quite realistic, both in terms of shape identities and also in terms of um, animation quality. So apart from Scape, there were other models like um, one by Allen um, that had many of the components that are um, present in Simple, but Probably they didn't have enough data, like some of the uh, things were not um, executed as, as they should, and that therefore the results don't look um, super realistic. But the ideas were, were really, um, really important and instrumental for, for papers that came later, like, for example, like the simple model. There were other works that were basically having a collection of bones. This is the work by Hassler et al. So these were like different um, body models that appeared also. One worth mentioning is the Tenbo model, which was basically based, based on, on um, a tensor factorization of pose and shape. Um, and then it's worth mentioning that 
around 2010, actually when I was starting my PhD, uh, like the use of, of human body models was not widespread. There was no human body model available. And so what we did to track is like, we 3D scanned the subject that we want to track. Um, for example, here, right? I mean, we scanned the subject and then basically you would manually insert a skeleton inside and then you would have an algorithm that would compute how the body can um, deform. And this was a very tedious process. We had our tools to, to automatize this and make it fast, but still it took like a few hours to, to build a single model that you could animate. Um, and also uh, like it, it basically was limited to the clothing you were wearing at that point. So it didn't adapt to, to new um, to new clothing you might wear. And it was of course subject specific. So it, you could not use the same model for different shapes. Um, and then there were works that um, essentially they were um, looking at skeleton free or combinations of a skeleton with skeleton free deformation. This is essentially um, you you can attach like a, like what is called like a like a, a node that determines how local geometry can deform, and then you impose that the geometry should change should deform smoothly. And this um, gives a lot of flexibility, um, but but also like uh, these models tend to be a little bit brittle because the skeleton is much more uh, constrains the motion much more than these models that are more freeform. But these were called like freeform surface deformation, which had many degrees of freedom. They are flexible, but they are typically um, like um, they have too many degrees of freedom when the observations are noisy. Okay, so this is as much as I wanted to describe about um, the history of body models. Now I would like to um, to describe a little bit where we stand right now, and at the end I want to um, like like give you a gist of what the things that we will see during the lecture. Um, I will make a pause now, and I will basically end this video here, and then I will continue with another video.